So my guest this afternoon is Vivian Manasse, and she is a lawyer, an interculturalist, an executive and life coach, as well as a board member. She's the founding partner and manager of Going Places International Consultants. Now, besides having qualifications as long as my arm for all of those roles that I just mentioned, um, Vivian has been pioneering intercultural consultancy in Brazil since 1999. And in that position, she's trained and coached over 15,000 employees of Fortune 500 companies, such as Bayer, BASF, Accenture, Banco Santander, just to name a few of them. And she's very multicultural. She speaks fluently Portuguese, English, German, and Spanish, not necessarily in that order, I think. And we are going to talk today about intercultural intelligence and how important that that is for your success in international business. Thank you, Vivian, for taking the time to join us. Well, th thank you for inviting me. Thank you for taking the time to, to value. Uh, hopefully, I, I, I can add to, to your program, which is very exciting. Thank you. Maybe you can tell us how it was that you were inspired to get into international business because i know even if you have a multicultural background it's not always to be taken for granted that you go into international business no but i was always fascinated by it i i and i i was telling you before i i you say i was born multicultural um you know immigrant parents german jewish immigrant parents into south america first bolivia and then brazil where i was born and that alone is already the, the first cultural clash that I had to, to deal with. So, for instance, uh, in, a, in, a, in a very group-oriented, socially group-oriented um, city and country, my father would say from his very German perspective, oh, Brazilians are very individualistic because they would park anywhere, you know. Um, and, and for his perspective, this was individualism. And I would see people that wouldn't even go to the beach by themselves and go, well, how can they be individuals? So, so I grew up with, with, with those questions and it, it intrigued me. And little by little, I, I, I started, you know, finding the maybe answers for this. And then with, with the law practice, it was always there because, because of the language um, knowledge, I was pulled into international law firms. And, and there you, you, you have the, the whole um, uh, uh, law conflict, which law applies, and, and then you have the clients who act differently and want you to respond differently. Um, and it fascinates me, and, and I'm so lucky that I can work with that. Um, I was formally pulled into this after I did my master's in law in the US, and then we lived in Canada, and I was invited to teach, and that's how I went deeper into this, into this role. And, um, to, to teach this or consult on this. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating area that also encompasses quite a wide range of skills. So it's, it's not just a very uh, narrow field that you're, that you're working in. No, it's not a narrow field. And I'm happy to say that you now have in, in the literature or in research, you can find something that they call intercultural intelligence beside you know the i the the formal iq um and and maybe also the emotional um, intelligence you now uh, add on the intercultural intelligence uh, which which many minimize many many minimize but i've i found it's it's incredibly useful especially through pandemic and post pandemic era uh, because uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that when you have intercultural intelligence or you, de you develop it, you're developing skills that are basically the same as all of us have to develop right now and will have to develop further, you know. Yes. And, and later, if you want, I can go into those. Because um, for me, this was one of the most fascinating learnings from, from what we're going through right now mm -hmm. no i can imagine because a lot of the skills that you use if you are managing a global team are the ones that you need to manage a virtual team because you have to manage it by 
nature of the distance between you, you have to manage your global team to a certain extent on a virtual basis. Even if you don't have video conferencing, you still have to manage in that way. So if we just start a little bit at the beginning and you say, okay, a company comes to you and they're talking and they about intercultural training for their staff, which staff do you recommend to them should receive which kind of intercultural training? So I know question. it's difficult to answer, but no, it's an excellent question. And, and it's, it's this dialogue is just so important. And, and just for the audience, uh, one thing that this answer is right now, you know, this would, one thing I have learned, it's very situational, uh, which explains why I love situational leadership. It goes hand in hand with interculturalism because it is situational. So again, it depends, but usually people minimize and they would say, oh, let's just do this with people that interact internationally, you know, physically or, or virtually or, or even just the ones that are going to move um, definitely somewhere or for a longer period. And I go and I always hold my head as if, oh God, that's not really this, the whole spectrum. It, it will help, of course, but you're leaving out many players that maybe indirectly have to deal with certain new cultures. You know, if your boss is under a certain pressure of someone sitting, I don't know, in Australia, you know, um, just as an example. So we're dealing with the physical um, distance, we're, de we're dealing with, with time change um, and we time difference. And we're dealing with a certain type of communication that your boss might have to apply to be efficient. So that means very often that for in order to you to, for you to be efficient for your boss, it might be really interesting that you start feeding your information to the boss in a more Australian customized way, right? Mm -hmm. So so it's very it, it, it's important so you you develop empathy with whoever is working with you and it doesn't have people always think it's only you know top down it's, it's also it's it's to the sides you know what are what how can i contribute and if i i need to know what the pe person is is focusing on or or what what kind of what kind of pressure what kind of demand is this person under where I can facilitate things for them and, and feed in a way that that will advance, you know, in timing and efficiency. So, so in other words, most likely I would say, who is the person who is really in contact with this other culture, with this, this challenge, and who is immediately around this person, you know? Yeah. And that, that increases, let's say, the, the group a little bit. Yeah. I mean, in my experience, I've also seen that often it's those people who you don't think of as having, let's say, front facing customer contact who then have the most problems. Because, for example, somebody from the accounts department, maybe they only have contact with the customer or with the supplier at a time when there's a problem with something. And so the situation is already under pressure. It's already... A little bit difficult and then you have somebody dealing with that problem who doesn't speak fluently either English or the target language and they also have no idea how to deal with somebody other than to work exactly as they would with a domestic customer. Exactly the mindset they don't know the mindset they, they get fr uh, frustrated at sort of an email that comes in in a certain way that that doesn't you know doesn't sound well for the person and, and the person then responds very defensively um we've had examples if, if if you accept examples i've had um a leading leading it company i mean they are everywhere i'm not going to say the name uh, and and i had a very advanced interculturally advanced group there because they they were kind of the back office for for the rest of the world based out of the south of Brazil. And, and this person was behind himself. He says, look at this answer. Look at, look, look at 
this, they are asking me to do something because they're going on vacation. Of course, this came from Europe, right? Um, because there's this perception that there's a lot of vacation time. And I said, well, but, and he was reading it incredibly aggressively in a way, this person is going on vacation and I have the work to do. I said, no, 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 wait, wait. This, this person is going on vacation, but actually if you read it a little bit differently, you will see he or she is just covering, uh, you know, just letting you know, in a way, letting you know and asking if you have any urgency before this person goes on vacation. So it's yeah. actually um, a kind of preparation. Actually, yes. So it's something, oh, okay. And, and I could see a, a shift, a shift in, in approach the moment the person became a little bit more, let's say, interculturally uh, intelligent, which is a combination between certain attitudes plus the knowledge, the specific knowledge about how, how that specific culture works in terms of mindset, priorities, values, you know. It's, so it's a, it's a combination of both that, that would make the, the biggest impact, you know. Yeah. And do you have something like a set of questions that when you go into a company that you ask them for, for preparation where you would say, okay, I need to, I need to at least know about this or what to think about that well, companies maybe who are listening could say okay i need to think about this topic or maybe yeah. i need to consider more about that yes usually they the usually reaction is that i ask too many questions to begin <laughs> with. um because one of the the one of the main things with with culture to be to to deal with culture effectively you got to understand it has it's all about context. What's the context? And to understand the context, you, you need to observe. And if you're not there, you need to ask to get yourself a fair scenario of what's going on as much as possible. And by the way, context is now one of the skills that, you know, um, the, the modern scenario of doing business, agility, vulnerability, you know, all those uh, uncertainty, context is very, very important. So whoever exercises intercultural context reading or scanning is also much more prepared to do this in different scenarios that don't involve necessarily a different, um, a different national culture. Mm -hmm. It's, you can apply this to your, you know, to, to the department next door or. Yeah, to a service vendor or something like that who. Yes, if you're dealing with someone who might be coming from a different service culture, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or co consumer product culture. And, and, the, and what fascinates me is that this, this intercultural intelligence development is, can be fun because when you, when you uh, apply this to a different culture, let's say China, not only you're developing the muscles for being more intelligent in the culture, you're also learning a lot about a very different, let's say exotic culture for most of us. Uh, so it's a very fun way um, to develop those skills. Yeah, I mean, it's also that question that when you ask those questions and you show somebody that you're interested and prepared to learn about their culture, then you automatically are building a relationship to that person because they yes. see that you are genuinely interested, not in the sense of you asking them questions and they're kind of like somebody in prison who's sitting like, like this, yeah. but they see that you're interested to learn about their culture and to understand, and they're more likely to, let's say, give you some leeway if maybe you make some cultural mistakes or something yeah. like that. And, and that goes into, if you allow me, exam very concrete examples of intercultural learnings. So usually you can uh, discern in intercultural communication the ones that are low context and the ones that are high context. So low context is possibly people in your neighborhood. You in Austria, so would be the Swiss, 
the Germans, the Czech, the Austrians, you know, um, very, very straight to the point, you know, questions, but very precise questions, also only answering questions back if they are precise enough for them to understand and go back and, and give that to, to them. Um, and they are prepared with a list of questions, etc., and, and focused on the result. Whereas the, 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 the high context uh, societies, Brazil is one of them, Japan is one of them, will sometimes even through silence or through non-speaking, through non-verbal interaction, trying to capture the same information. Yeah. You know, what's not being said. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that when you say, well, you should pose questions, then I, I have trouble with the Brazilians because they will be a little bit embarrassed to do as many formal questions because intelligence here is measured by inductive intelligence. What can you find out without asking questions? So, so it's a conflict. So each each uh, audience needs their to learn their own their own preferred style, and then most likely through this preferred style adjust their practice to to find out more. And see that, that this is a great advice that you gave. It's wonderful, except that it doesn't work for everyone in the same way. Yeah, it's always the same. You can give advice as much as you like, but it's not going to be universally valid. <laughs> it's no, no, no. So, so if if you, for instance, what are the points that someone who's who's working internationally should look? Is you know, um, I would say first uh, recognize instead of minimize. Big mistake to say I'm just doing business next door. Um, and in our case in Brazil, next door is really far away. And it's not that we're interacting all the time. Yeah. So, well, it's just the Chileans. It's very, you know, the Latin Americans or Mexico. Biggest mistake is to minimize. Even between United States and Canada, don't minimize. You're, 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 you're wasting the richness of the difference and how much you can build, on, build positively on the, on the difference. You know, it's, not, it's, it's, it's in a positive way. So first of all, recognize instead of minimize that there is a difference and things to be learned. I think that's the, the second one. Look and learn to identify people's core values that motivate them to do something, mm -hmm. that motivate them to listen to you, to interact with you, to ask you questions. What motivates them, you know, to, to, to be around you, to want you around them, right? To cooperate with them. Um, from there, then you start adopting what I would call smart um, approaches, right? So, um, if the person isn't comfortable with personal questions, then most likely you will have to establish this relationship on the basis of business questions, you know, or um, and this applies, of course, in in-person situations. I have a client who really, the only way you get things moving along in a conversation is if you go for lunch with him. You, if you sit at the office with him, he gets so distracted with other stuff, you know. Uh, that's a personal style. It's not necessarily a, a national style. But... What's the, 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 what have we found out? The best way to talk to, to him is to schedule lunch. And you go to lunch and you talk about everything. And at some point you say, excuse me, I'm bringing out my notebook. Let me ask you some questions. What do we do here? And, and what, you know, um, so, so that's what I, I mean with approach, of, with using uh, more effective approaching. And, and then what you do with all of that is that you allow for different perspectives in decision making and problem solving, which is what we do all the time. Yeah. That's what we do all the time. Um, 
it's because you have opened your you have opened your 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 horizons you have maybe expanded your checklist we were talking about that um what is it that someone going into a, a different environment international business and from a lawyer perspective this is, this is very real uh the bigger your checklist the better but how can you know what's on your checklist if you don't get help from the specialists you know and and, and the, i understand that's just, that's one of the goals of of, of your series is what should be on my checklist you know and you're lucky if if some of those items don't apply to your operation great you know good good news but the the blind spots are um, are, are really dangerous yes. in, in every area tax or whatever but yes. also in interculturalism they, they are their blind spots are very very dangerous yeah it's like um one of the leading themes that goes through all of the interviews that I've conducted up until now for this, for this event were, there were two main ones. The first one, don't assume anything. Yeah. And the second one was that, let's say you need to, you don't know what you don't know. And so you always need to try to be open for learning more and to take in new information from whatever sources are prepared to offer you information, be those, let's say, classical desk research, or be it somebody who you can talk to, who can help you, or who can just give you just small hints. Even if you talk for 10 minutes with someone and you just have a small nugget of information about what counts as good manners when you're drinking tea in a country or, and that's interesting um the do's and don'ts list that people want Ugh. i think there are a lot of fun there i think there are, there are lots of fun and they're but they're they're easily you can easily find them on the internet yes and that's what you do that's what it is that's it's not more than that and then what happens is it's just a list and 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 it, it's not natural to you it doesn't come natural to you and usually usually people will forgive you because you're yes you're a foreigner so so i still think they're valuable but they're less relevant than trying to find out what's behind those those behaviors those do's and don'ts what's the value behind this you know why is it that in german you never say ich und katrin you always say Katrin and, and Katrin und ich, Katrin and I. Mm -hmm. So my father would always say, if I made this wrong, he would say, oh, you really put the, the donkey in front of the cart, right? Meaning I put my name, so I learned it this way, I'll never forget. But what's behind it is the sense of why are you putting yourself first? Yes. And it's very strict. It's, it's a big mistake yes. to do that. It, it really it's in english too it's the same in english it's a grammatical uh yeah but uh, in in english it's it's also that i mean i remember my grandma saying this to my younger sister one time and i have this picture of exactly as you say your dad saying don't put the donkey before the cart and it, she was saying do you think you're the center of the world it's very disturbing because the the you can't avoid it. a german person or, or english speaking person will immediately it's, a, it's like a pushback and so oof, this person is very self-centered uh and maybe the person isn't but but just by saying it so those are certain certain practices that i would insist that are done differently even the handshake you know the handshake if it's not just like this for a germanic person i would say in general uh, and sometimes they exaggerate, I would say. It's, it's a sign of, you're not firm, I can't trust you, you know. Uh, in Asian countries, it's maybe just the opposite, you know, don't, don't be so aggressive. aggressive. Yeah, so, so certain things are, are, have meanings behind that, that, ex, that you can then use for other practices, you know, um, of not being late, of not using, um, what's, what's the big, what's the big pain of being five minutes late what maybe a brazilian would say you know well 
behind that, there's a whole value system of, of wait a minute, I, I gave you my time, but, but it's for you, use it. Don't let me stand in here, you're wasting my gift to you. And worse, maybe you're gonna make me late for the next appointment and those next five minutes, it's only five minutes, but that's someone else's time, which is even worse than you wasting my time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and this is learned by example, since you were little, etc. So why not looking into this and, and kind of, I always use also the term honor. It's not only learn, honor the culture, you know, honor, honor what, oh, interesting. That's very different from us, but that's, that's a very interesting perspective. You know, I think that that is part of, of intercultural intelligence is, is to look at things. Uh, oh, this is a laundry list of things that I have to do. No, no, it's a laundry list of interesting approaches that you that you can learn, you know, yes. and, and, and adopt. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I remember when I was, let's say, at the beginning of my exporting career and I was responsible for the Egyptian market. I was responsible for Scandinavia, so let's say Northern Europe, and also Egypt. Wow, <laughs> very different. <laughs> One of those things. And um, I remember being in the, the first time I went, I was introduced by a colleague who was very happy to be handing over the Egyptian market to, to me. <laughs> and he said to me, you know, they're always late. They're always late. And it was something that you could tell, but it really bothered him. Mm. And after the, first, after the first meeting where I realized that they were always, I mean, there's in Cairo, you have some part which is due to traffic that you can't calculate so easily. I'm sure Rio is probably the same. Rio and Sao Paulo, yeah. Yeah. Um, but also there was this, this feeling that, okay, if I say to you nine, then actually it's going to be, 10 30 or whatever and mm. so after the first visit i just decided i i wasn't going to stress about this so i instead of sitting in the lobby at 25 minutes past nine i would just stay in my room and use the time to do something else okay. you know i mean i wouldn't say okay i'm gonna go for a walk or i'm gonna go swimming or somewhere <laughs> away from the but mm -hmm. I would be at my computer yes. doing emails, something yeah. like this. And so if they called and said, okay, the, the driver is in the lobby for you, I could just take my things and yeah. go very immediately. And it was no problem. But I know that it's, a, some people find it very stressful to have that kind of. So that, that's also the, the developing a sense of flexibility and, and comfort with ambiguity which again is something that we have to do now, yeah. all of us, no matter where we, who we work with. Um, and your example was, is, is what I usually um, recommend to people. Listen, how do you use this comfortably? Don't tell me you don't have on your own to-do list enough stuff that is behind or that you can pull, you know, you can maybe um, do something on your bank, uh, uh, with your bank or, or, or Things that you can, you know, pull out of order and, and, and f as fillers for those waiting times. And that's very common practice in Brazil and, and um, very common practice. Of course, the moment you have interactions in multinational companies, you start having a lot of meetings also abroad on, on, a, on a screen, then people have become far more strict. And, and also uh, the other thing that, that requires a lot of patience and maybe it's like this in Egypt too, is the agenda is sometimes only symbolic, is very often too ambitious, not realistic. We're, you know, and it's, it, it's not with a bad intention, it's just this passionate way of saying, oh, I want to talk about all of this. And then there's no rational realization that, wait a minute, this is far too little time for four subjects, you know, yeah. um, and renegotiating this and, and splitting this up in, in, in smaller portions, you know, uh, those are things that 
that, that sometimes someone from a more organized or, or linear culture could then nicely suggest, you know, um, listen, why don't we, um, next time we keep just one subject or two subjects, because it's also uh, not only rude, but sometimes not, not interesting to cut short a, a longer presentation. Again, coming back to the, to the circular or, or, or high context kind of communication, you don't want to necessarily cut through all of it because this person is trying to give you information that sometimes is not on the slides yeah. and that is vital. Yeah. That, that is vital. Uh, maybe one-on-one -on -one you can say, listen, you know, those are the things I need to know for next presentation. But it is, it is, it is an exercise it, it, and it's time needed to, it's, it's important to invest time in this. And then going back to what you said, what would you say to your client? I would say, well, what's the audience that your team has to talk to or present to? And, and why don't you, why don't we do X time of intercultural um, intelligence or intercultural training towards, I don't know, the American work style, you know? Yeah. And that can be, that can take sometimes eight hours as if you wanna do, you know, interactive exercise, etc. And sometimes it's a matter of an hour and a half, two on a webinar scale you know um so there are there are ways there are really interesting ways to to approach this um instead of minimizing it and and, and just let it linger you know mm -hmm. no i think it's important also to acknowledge that there are different people different people also need different time spans even within a culture to absorb new behavioral patterns or something like that and so especially if you're trying to teach them a topic or you're trying to discuss with a group a topic like negotiation on an intercultural level then some people find it very easy to adapt to new techniques and some people just just find it so difficult to take on board if they if they've never done it that way before that's that's a really good point and i think there is maybe solutions for that you don't have to be good at everything you don't uh it's too much effort and it's also not realistic i yeah. think so so i would say if you find certain traits of a culture to be something that you know you, you find it difficult to adapt you might need maybe a buddy someone that does well in that with that style and kind of try and partner with with this person you know this person could coach you beforehand or this person could be the one that asks the difficult questions or this person could be the one that feeds you the information that you you couldn't read you know that's actually a very nice way to cooperate um, and, and sometimes you will be the one trend because it's, it's, it's almost like translating someone else's meaning or, or, you know, uh, or demeaning, you know, demeanor. How, yeah. how do you, how am I reading this? Am I reading this right? You know? Um, so, so that's my role very often. That's very often my role. If, if I go into coaching with those people, then a lot of this is, how do I read this? You know, that's what my boss said. How do I read this? So, so if I go into examples, if you allow me, um, years ago, and it, 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 it does involve the, the German culture and the Brazilian culture. Years ago, I had a participant that was transferred to Germany and she was very, very self-assured. She was very, she had a relationship with the, with the German uh, man and, um, had been working for the German company here in Sao Paulo for years. And she uh, was very self-assured and, and, and in a way minimizing a little bit 
in the training room, you know, you know I, a little bit of know-it-all kind of attitude. Okay, fine. Well, sure enough, unfortunately, she came back much before her assignment was due and she came back very destroyed, emotionally destroyed. And unfortunately, this company at that point used to allow also for repat, repatriation training. Um, and, and this person came back destroyed. And as we found out, lots of things didn't work. The relationship didn't work. Certain things didn't work. But what really hit her is that she felt she had been a failure in work. And so as we went over her history, you know, and I was decoding it in a way, I said, wait a minute, you just said your boss, your German boss, kept giving you more and more responsibility. And she says, yes. I said, this man must have been um, very frustrated that you said you were leaving. She said, why? I don't think he liked my work. He never praised me. I said, no, see, you got it. <laughs> he was giving you the biggest praise there is. He was giving you more responsibility. That means more trust. And that means that you were doing a fantastic job. And she holds her head and looks at me and says, oh, I got that all wrong. So, you know, the, the, the decoding is different for every culture, right? Um, and, and sometimes you need, you said you, you work a lot with China. And sometimes the yes or the no is not very specific. But it, the more you get accustomed to, to their style, I'm sure you're an expert at this point. Um, you can read the no. Yes. You know, mm, that's certainly not a yes, let's say. Let's put it like this. Yeah. And I think it's also if you're in the position of being the if you're in the position of being the country manager for I don't know, it doesn't matter if it's Russia or Serbia or Estonia or China, and you go there with somebody else from your team, whether it's a marketing manager or whether it's your boss, then it puts you in the position of this decoder that you have to explain to the Yes to the person who's traveling with you, okay, um, this is what you have to expect. And if they, and if after the meeting they say, oh, well, that went well, and you're thinking, <laughs> I'm going to spend the next six months repairing the damage you just did, oh, God, then, yeah. um, then you have to be able to say to them, okay, you actually need to understand that when a person from this culture says this, then they mean this or if they let's say if they don't invite you for lunch then it's a very bad sign or i don't know what is the best example <laughs> you know yes. no in brazil they say if they didn't invite you for coffee it was a bad meeting on the other hand i've seen meetings just that people were so excited that they forgot about the coffee which is also a good thing you know so 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 again the scanning them can't phrase it more. The scanning, the how do you call that? Reading the room. Yeah. That's that's the thing. Reading the room has become more and more important. And how do you read the room in that setting? So uh, funny enough, when we started, I said, "Oh, interesting. We both have like bookcases in the back, yeah. and that tells me a little bit about you, you know." And if, and and quite frankly, when I was interviewing other people. I kind of asked them to move their computer around uh, to see what they had. And it was very revealing what they had on the whiteboards, et cetera, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it really made me understand so much more. So that's the other thing. Um, so I have a, I have a, a, I know a person who all, all of a sudden comes in with a, um, how do you call that? I'm a um, loop um, with a, um, a magnifying glass. A magnifier. <laughs> I said, what are you doing? And I think the person is looking at your pictures and, it, uh, it really and the books behind is scanning you. Your, is, is scanning your, your, your books, you know, what are you reading? And, and all of that is information. It's context is very important. 
And I have to tell you, which worries me a little bit, um, I, 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 I force myself to understand more and more about the digital world and, and the digitals, digital, digital professionals and, and, and the importance they're gaining in every corporation, every organization. And when we talk about um, in artificial intelligence, and, and you know that's a, a discussion now. What is this intelligence taking into consideration as facts? What approach? What bias? What you know? What kind of angle? Mm -hmm. um, and there, I think there's a big chance for digital um, professionals. The more context conscious they are, the more value they will will add. Uh, and, but unfortunately, the typical, let's say the typical IT person, you know, typical, is, is much more fact-oriented, impatient, not very willing to scan the environment. And that scares me a little bit because we might become victims of that in a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, and it's also, it's, you need to be even more aware of the environment when you're doing business in a digital environment because it's much harder to read the room when you're doing it through a camera. Yeah. You have less of this kind of nonverbal communication. You can only see me from, let's say you can only see me from here upwards. You don't see that my foot is maybe tapping. So yeah. I'm either maybe I'm nervous or maybe I'm angry or, or something like that. You only see what I'm showing you in front of the camera. Yeah. Yes. In the same way that you see my bookcases behind, you don't see maybe, I don't know, you don't see what I have behind my laptop or you don't see. Yeah. I hit the, I hit a little bit of my mess too. But <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, you're exactly. So this, this reading the room, I think, in other words, if you didn't have it in the, in the, let's say, in the, the real world, in the, 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 you know, physical world, then it might be even more dangerous not to develop that um, in this, and not to use it in this, in this scenario that we're in, right? But do you think that it's possible for people to, let's say, learn this kind of empathy that? helps them to build or do you think that people naturally have it or don't have it some do some do you know some do and the ones that don't i'm convinced they can learn uh there are certain exercises that i apply that that are a shift in your perspective it, it, they generate a shift in perspective of course if you're going to do a, the, the are you going to apply the exercise that's that's your choice you know i can't force you but you know the you can't even force kids, let alone adults. But um, it, it is very, very useful. And you know what? You know where I got it from? And that's the most fascinating to me. It's a Japanese exercise. And, and it, it, it's so interesting. It's, it's, such, it's an ancient mindset of, you know how they say that the Japanese ask a lot of questions? You know? And, and a lot of the Western world think they are doing this because they don't trust us. And it's not usually the mindset. It could be in certain instances, you know, uh, certain people sometimes also don't, are not trustworthy and, and might be, you know, the, the fact. But in general, it's not that. It's, it's much more to find out your context so that I eventually can make a suggestion that makes sense for you and I, you know, and that's why I will ask and I will find out what impact my behavior might have that might be negative. And so I rework this, you know, and there, there is an exercise for that. So when you tell me, and, and interesting, maybe if you asked me a few years ago, I would say, no, nah, very difficult. But that exercise that I pulled out out of a Japanese mindset and mindfulness exercise will it help us Westerners to, to practice this. Pra practice and learn empathy. That's very important. Yeah. 
No, it's very important because there are so many people who are maybe often highly intelligent people, but they just don't have that empathy naturally to to go into rooms with a lot of people from their own culture, never mind people from a completely different culture to the one that they've grown up in. Another example, you tell me when, when, if I'm talking too much or if I'm going into the wrong direction. Another example that I find fascinating and that is really taken out of a different culture is a win-win agreement, a win-win situation, a win-win solution. I have learned from the USA, from the practices in the USA. Oh, and what is the motivation behind highly empathic people? No, no. You know why? Because the win-win situations are the fastest ones, the most effective ones, and the, the ones that, that take less time, which is the, the, most, the, the biggest motivator in the U.S. mentality in general, not only in business. So, Time is I, money. In a linear society, time is money. Exactly. Yep. That, that's what it means. It's such a valuable asset that it moves me to behave in a certain way. So it moves me to inquire and understand as much as I can, what will be the fastest solution between you and I, the mm -hmm. fastest resolution, the, west, the fastest, more effective proposal I can make you. Because I want to do this fast. I want to get out of here. The next step, next step next tax. So I want to propose something that is acceptable to you and I. So that's usually the win-win proposal. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing because it's a very positive thing yeah. that maybe comes out of a, you know, very, very transactional um, kind of mindset mm -hmm. with, 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 a, with a wonderful effect. Yeah. And that's something that can be used internationally because a win-win solution, I don't know any culture who doesn't, who doesn't feel comfortable with a win-win, although there are sometimes people who insist that they have to be, let's say, 51% and not 14, not 50%. Yes, there are cultures that teach the non-win, the win-lose. Yes. They, I don't want to say which one because it's it's not you know <laughs> the nicest trait they have other wonderful traits but mm -hmm. the, the cultures that 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 teach the win lose and and that's where you come in and and tell them listen you wanting to win is taking too long and you're actually losing in the process you know yeah uh, and in and, and, so I, I think it's fascinating that the, once you open up to culture, not only looking at it at, oh, what are the big mistakes I can make, uh, but rather what can I learn? Mm -hmm. It's far more positive and it's out there. And, and if you prepare yourself with the right questions, with what are the things in this society that, is it hierarchy that I have to look at? because maybe that plays a tremendous role. Is it social differences? You know, is it religious differences that I have to be watching out? You know, um, is it religion or is it money? You know, what, what, is the, what is the relevance, you know, in that society? Maybe someone is focusing on religion and when you look at it, hmm, there is a shift. Is it race? Yeah. Or is it social strata? Or is it both? You know, um, how isolated is this country? When you talk about Brazil, Brazil is an island inside uh, South America, as an example. You know, it's not geographically an island per se, but as a mentality, yes. You know, mm -hmm. so what kind? You were saying you're really cl close to the Czech border. Um, close to the German border, that, that makes a big difference in how you perceive and how open you are to perceiving the, the cultural matters, you know. Um, and it makes a huge difference when you can say that you will, for a day, just go somewhere. 
you know, that you can just drive somewhere for lunch and come back home again, but you were in a completely different place. That is something that from the UK, for example, that was something that fascinated me as a student because here I could do that in Austria yeah. and from the UK, you can't, unless you live very close to the, yes. the tunnel, you could, from the nineties onwards, you could go to France for lunch, but otherwise yeah. you can't go to a different country for lunch. It's, um, no, we can't either. <laughs> we can't either. That's the, the fascinating thing in, in Europe. So that's, that's um, really important. Yeah. No, that's, that's a really important point. And I think that, like we said, this year, so many teams have had to learn all of these, they've had to learn all of these virtual skills. And it's, it's very, I at least with, with my clients have, have found that it's very easy to maintain relationships over these kind of virtual channels even across a lot of different countries, but it's very hard to build new relationships. Um, in a, Interesting. <laughs> you know, it's very hard unless you have like an introduction, for example, like we had an introduction, so it was relatively easy for us to, to come into some kind of contact because we had some kind of context also, but to to look for clients or to look for partners for a client in mm. future at least it's it's very difficult if you don't already have some kind of um connection in the real physical world oh, i will have to say i don't agree no and i think if i think of it i think it is for my passion and maybe I have the intercultural ability to read into a LinkedIn profile, mm -hmm. you know, so I found partners in Turkey mm -hmm. through the LinkedIn profile and we work together now a lot. I've, we've never met in person, but that was even pre pandemic. I've had in the last seven months, Mo I, I never had anyone in this room. It was always through, through this screen. Yep. And I have developed really interesting projects, even with clients, with, with, with expats that, that, that were open to engage into, you know, my volunteer projects, for instance. Mm -hmm. And it's happening. And I just recently, uh, coincidentally, did meet her uh, last week because I wasn't in the town she moved to and we carefully you know we sat far away but and 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 I, and I think the, the intercultural ability in, in the screening process about who what has this we have things in common okay let's build on that mm -hmm. and, and and that and you're very good at this I would say um, um, maybe 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 you need, maybe you're very European, you need more time. You know the coconut um, theory? I don't know this one. No, you don't know it? Okay. Glad, I'm, I'm glad you, pick, you picked up on that. So coconut, okay? This is not a real one, it's a um, decoration one. But so the, the coconut um, person, or coconut culture, a hard shell, right? Mm -hmm. If you wanted to drink the coconut, it would be difficult because you would have to cut it. It's a lot of effort yep. to get into the coconut water, you know, that if it's ripe, if it's ripe, it's very sweet. No kernels, right? Mm -hmm. Diffuse. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the 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 coconut cultures and i hate to say this the uk has a very hard shell and, and 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 then the austrians to a certain degree to all europeans including uh, after brexit uh uk citizens uh have you know their shell is quite hard and it takes longer to break through and establish trust
<laughs> That's why also usually it's societies where you say you have acquaintances versus friends. Friend, friend is someone who you let in here. And, and because it takes so long, usually it's only five or six people in your whole life. Uh, Vis-a-vis -vis the, the peach structure that is typically um, North American, especially in the US. Mm -hmm. When you, you know, you have a peach, easy to buy it at the first it. level. And, and then you have a kernel where you basically never, it's impossible to get it. It's poisonous. And, and this peach is actually genetically modified and has, it's a, it's a mixture between a tangerine and a peach. Okay, imagine a mixture between a tangerine. And, so it has the little pieces of a tangerine. That means that once you bite into this peach tangerine, <laughs> I just made that up now, uh, you're stuck inside that compartment. Mm -hmm. That means that it's nice and sweet and good, maybe at your work department, but just there with those people, if they meet you at the gym, it's a different environment and, and they're there for another reason and you're not part of that environment for them. And they barely talk to you. That, that, for, that is a big culture clash between Europeans and North Americans. Um, and, and in my case, because I'm German raised, I'm not, my shell is not so, I'm a coconut in Brazil. People say I'm, I'm very distant at first. Imagine. Um, <laughs> but everything <laughs> is relative, right? Um, so for Brazilians, I'm a coconut. Mm -hmm. And I have the hardest time with the, ta with the peach tangerine model. I, I'm, I, will, I don't think I will get ever used to it. Um, I will deal with it. Mm -hmm but I almost refuse to get used to it because those, for me, is not a friendship. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah. No, but I can, I can appreciate that because it's what you say is very logical. It's what we, what a lot of Europeans, and it doesn't matter if you talk with Scandinavians or you talk with Brits or you talk with um, Germans or Austrians, then you have, this similar feeling about Americans that it's it's relatively easy to have some kind of superficial contact and it's very nice and they're kind and and very so kind. but it's not it's much harder to to actually form a, what would be classified in Europe as a genuine friendship um, that goes beyond yeah. just what you have at work maybe or like you said just at the gym or just at the sports club something like that and it has nothing to do with you being foreign or not. That's how their social um, interaction happens among themselves too. So it's, it has nothing to do because you're an outsider or anything like that. No, I think it's the same for everybody. It's not like they, they treat me or somebody else just as... Yeah. Yeah. Vivian, we're coming a little bit to the end of yes. our discussion today i just wanted to ask you what are the what are the most i know it's also maybe not such a short question but what are the most frequent intercultural mistakes that you see people working making when they first go into international markets uh, well i i meant in general i, I mentioned like the, the the recognize instead of minimize you know um the lack of the, 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 I think that's a, the biggest mistake is to minimize and actually waste a wonderful, a wonderful chance to learn more. You know, I, I, I think that's the biggest mistake. Um, the, the, the second mistake, it still has a lot to do with minimize. Well, the second mistake or unfortunate thing is not to have a sense of humor about it <laughs> because of the funny stories that you will generate by doing your mistakes. You know, even if you mm -hmm. go in with the best intentions, you still will 
uh, once in a while, um, there is this German expert in this Fettnäpfchen. Um, mm -hmm. Now put your foot in it. Yes. Good in your mouth. Yes. Um, so, so not having a, um, a sense of humor will be bad. Not also having a little bit of, of patience with yourself, you know, in the sense of, I don't know it all and it's okay. I'm learning and, and not being so, so uptight about, about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, then next step is really this question, you know, to, to, to pose the questions. It's, it's still in the, in the process. Once you recognize and you want to learn more, you have to, you, you either have to start asking the questions and learn how to ask the questions. Yeah. And or having a keen observation, a willingness of doing a keen observation, you know. Um, so in a way, what I'm telling you is you err more by minimizing and by not doing than by doing, right? Um, and, and maybe uh, last but not least, two examples, if we are finishing here, is um, I have examples of leadership situations the other way around. You know, the first example I gave was not recognizing that you're being recognized. Um, whereas I have situations of leaders going into Canada, for instance, and, and, and not realizing how important it was to volunteer for the community. And not only being a little bit suspicious about the time that the employees or the team was putting into uh, projects that demanded volunteering and think mm, they're just, you know, they're at the beach actually, or they, they're not doing volunteering, but, but yes, they were, it was even on TV, you know, and, and then this leader recognized not only that he was being unfair and had read it all wrong, but he should be there too. You know, uh, because then he would have been more part of the team and more recognized as a good leader. Uh, reversely, I had a Sp Spaniard coming into Brazil and, and saying things like to the team, I'm not here to be your friend. We're here to work together. And, and actually, there is an expectation, for instance, in Brazil that you not only are a friend, you become a family member. Mm -hmm. So... It was funny, he would say, he had a sense of humor, luckily. He said, oh, Vivian, I shouldn't have said that. I said it twice already, you know. So this, this screening process, I think, it, all I'm saying is, is you can summarize, but don't minimize. Take the, take the opportunity of learning. Uh, don't minimize. Don't, even if it's next door, even if it's next town. Mm -hmm. I'm almost sure they have a little bit that you can learn from uh, by observation of, of different approaches to different situations. Don't waste, don't you waste a good visit. Don't waste a good internationalization. Don't waste a new relationship. Yeah. So be open to what you can learn and keep yes. your eyes open, keep your ears open and learn how to, let's say, how to ask the questions or how, to get the information without directly asking the questions? Maybe both things. I think um, a good screen would say, what are the, that's three to six points that I really need to observe in that specific um, country or culture, mm -hmm. or corporate culture, you know? Um, and how, how should I find them out? Are those people that I could say, listen, I need some time do you have half an hour to talk to me, 15 minutes to talk to me? Or do I have to go to the karaoke with them? You know? Yes. Or to the barbecue on the weekend? Mm -hmm. What do you mean I have to spend time with a business partner on the weekend? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because that's where you're going to find out what you need to find out. Exactly yes. that. I think you're yes. a great question asker because you you guide you guided me very nicely thank you oh thank you was there anything that i missed out that you think that people really should know on this topic i mean i know it's such a huge topic we could probably talk all night 
Ya. Um, well, maybe don't look at intercultural intelligence as being a soft skill. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. It's a very hard skill. It's, a, it's, it's, it's there and it's underneath the iceberg or underneath your pyramid or underneath the construction that you're building. It's the, it's the basis. So it's very hardcore. It's not fluffy uh, knowledge. Nice that is, oh, very interesting to know conversational topics. No, you it's might build a whole. It, you might build a whole business plan, and I've seen this too often, based on numbers on the Excel tables. It looks really good on the, on paper, mm -hmm. but what's not on paper is what might break you and cost you a hundred percent more or even the whole business. So I think we covered it. <laughs> okay. Thanks Thank to your, uh, oh. your questioning skills. Thank you, Vivian. And thank you so much for taking the time today. Where can people go if they want to find out more about what you do and about what your company is offering as a service? So I don't know how you want to, uh, are you going to leave this in uh, notes or something in this? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, I'm always going to receive your email on the Vivian um, uh, at going places. Very easy. Goingplaces.com.br like Brazil. Okay. And always okay. available. Um, the other thing, oh, if you want to do business internationally, be open to using WhatsApp. I know in the US, many people don't. I don't know about Europe. I think that people have been mixed. People, mm. people often are encouraged not to use it for business because they say GDPR and data protection and it's not admissible in court and all of those kind of things. But from a practical side of things, people do. So, so I've been told that the encrypted conversation is, is going to be very difficult to, so at least be available to talk with WhatsApp. Yeah. Uh, the moment you, you say no to that, you're putting a, a, a wall between you and the person. Yeah. Uh, because it's very expensive in many countries. And, and when you say no, um, and, and you might use it wisely, as you said, don't use it as a, um, don't you to, even use it. Don't to negotiate the contract via WhatsApp, but you can and have a call with somebody. You might want to then bring into the email, you know, but don't close the door. This is a, this is the easy way to get to you. Certain yes. things cannot be written uh, or, or won't be effective. They need a conversation. Uh, so WhatsApp. So in this sense, I'm glad. I'm happy also to give the, the WhatsApp number to you. I don't. No one is going to uh, learn it by heart. So uh, if if it's okay, Catherine, I'll send it to you. Both things: okay. my email address and my my WhatsApp number, which apparently I can use everywhere. And um, more than happy Perfect. to help. Uh, more than happy to talk. And very honored that you invited me. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been really a pleasure to talk today.